Welcome to episode 203 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode in the show notes, which is at seven, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 203. Seven Health is currently taking on new clients. We specialize in helping you overcome disordered eating, body dissatisfaction and negative body image, regaining your periods, balancing hormones, and recovering from years of dieting by learning how to listen to your body. So if you're ready to put an end to these struggles and heal your relationship with food and with your body, then please get in contact. You can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help, and there you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. So the address again is 7-health.com forward slash help, and I've included this in the show notes as well. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. So this week on the show, I'm back with a guest interview, and my guest today is Harriet Brown. So Harriet is a professor of magazine, news, and digital journalism at SI Newhouse School of Public Communications and a sought-after speaker on college campuses around the country. She has written for the New York Times Science Section, the New York Times Magazine, Vice, Psychology Today, and other publications. Her most recent book is Shadow Daughter, a memoir of estrangement. She's also written Body of Truth, How Science, History, and Culture Drive Our Obsession with Weight and What You Can Do About It, and Brave Girl Eating, A Family Struggle with Anorexia. In 2011, she won the University of Iowa's John F. Murray Prize in Strategic Communications for Public Good for her work as an advocate for those with eating disorders. So I first became aware of Harriet back in 2015 when I read her book, Brave Girl Eating. Uh, It was a memoir about her daughter Kitty developing an eating disorder and the the family-based treatment that they used as part of her recovery. And Harriet really does have a way with words and it was a very honest account of what it was like and the toll that it took on the family and just how each of them were able to, to get through it. But for this week's show, our conversation is about Harriet's most recent book called Shadow Daughter, A Memoir of Estrangement. And this was a book that was recommended to me by Lou, so the other practitioner here at Seven Health. And a while back, I had a week where I just had a succession of clients where with each one of them, we'd had a conversation about difficult relationships with uh, within their family, but mostly with their, their mother's and where these difficulties had gone on for a really long time and going back as as long as they could remember. And it was at the heart of how they saw themselves and thought about themselves and was very much connected to their difficulties in recovery. And so I messaged Lou and asked, uh, did she have any favorite books or resources in this area? And in typical Lou form, I received a, a ton of wonderful resources and writing exercises and YouTube videos and, and book recommendations. And Shadow Daughter was one of those books. And I found it fascinating and enlightening but also very upsetting and, and frustrating, and not because of Harriet's writing. She is a ter- terrific author and writer, but because of what she was sharing about her own life and the lives of people that she interviewed for the book. And so that is what this episode is about, that family relationships can be fraught with difficulties, and that for many people, this reaches a point where it's actually better for them to not have that person or those people in their life. And despite this, there is still a lot of stigma around becoming estranged from family. And so even if it is this ultimate act of self-care, it's not always or not even often seen that way by others. So we talk about that, about the the stigma associated with it. We talk about Harriet's experience in her life and, and how that looked. We talk about attachment and conditional versus unconditional parenting and how experiences in early life have a huge impact on how someone has a sense of self and self-esteem for really the, the rest of their life. And we talk about the concept of forgiveness and what this actually means and 
all the exploration that Harriet has done in this area and some of the resources that, that she turned to as part of this and just, yeah, have a real conversation around what it means to forgive someone and who that is really for and what the ultimate goal with forgiveness is. And this is by no means a light conversation, but equally, I think it is a really important one because this is something that does affect many people and probably more people than we would imagine because of it still being taboo and and something that's not really talked about. And in the area of eating disorders and the client population that I see, it seems to be more common than the, the population at large. So yeah, I'm really glad that Harriet came on the show and we were able to have this conversation I will be back at the end with a recommendation for you. Uh, But for now, let's get on with the show. Here is my conversation with Harriet Brown. Hey, Harriet. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chris. So I'm really excited about this conversation. You've written a number of books, but for today, I I really want to focus on your most recent one called Shadow Daughter, A Memoir of Estrangement. And it's Mm -hmm. a book that's been very timely for me as I've been seeing it play out a lot for many clients that I work with. So yeah, really our time together, I just want to focus and explore this, this topic and look naturally being conversation, we can just see where, wherever it it leads as well. Um, As a starting place, you want to introduce yourself and and give a bio of sorts, like who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, I am a writer I also uh, have been a journalist and I'm a professor of journalism at Syracuse University. But um, in my writing, I have often focused on issues around food and eating and body image. Um, And this latest book is about family estrangement. And it grew out of my own uh, experience with my family of art relationship with my mother that wound up in a place of total no contact estrangement for a couple years before she died. And, um, you know, that had always been such a painful subject for me that I decided I would go talk to a lot of other people who had had that experience and go look at the research. And yeah, so, you know, going down that rabbit hole, which is what we writers love to do. Yeah. And how long had you been thinking about, writing about this as a, as a topic, like, did you have to get to a point where you could even write about it as a topic? Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, I'd been wanting to write about it probably for 20 years. I knew that I would not be able to write about it until if, and when my mother died before me. And then she died in 2011 and I just knew I wasn't ready um, and took me like another five or six years before I thought, okay, now I'm ready. You know, you have to get a certain amount of like emotional distance, yeah. uh, process everything. But I always wanted to write about it mostly because there's so many misconceptions about estrangement. You know, why do people get estranged and what does that mean? And, uh, there's a lot of social stigma around estrangement. So yeah, I knew it was something I wanted to dive into for sure. Yeah. And those, I mean, all of those things you mentioned there are, are things that I want to touch on today. And, and maybe a good place to start is just defining estrangement, because I know we're going to use that term again and again throughout this conversation. And just so listeners understand what that means. What a good, what a good uh, place to start, because I think a lot of people think estrangement means absolutely no contact. But in fact, it's Uh, one of the researchers I talked to in uh, writing this book said, think of it more as a continuum, which I think makes a lot of sense. So you can be anywhere on that continuum from, you know, uh, gosh, I just try to talk to my family as little as possible. I try to only see them the bare minimum. I try not to get into anything like significant or emotional with them you know, you can be all the way from, from that all the way up to, you know, no contact at all, no talking, no, you know, ever blocking them on all social media and you can be anywhere in between. And, you know, I think most people who wind up being estranged or describing themselves as estranged sort of bounce around that continuum for many years um, because nobody starts there. Right. Right we all start with this idea of 
a family, you know, we, we want to be close to our families. We want to love them and be loved by them. And, you know, when there are problems that are unresolvable over a long period of time, you know, most people do what I wound up doing, which was, you know, I would try and my mother would try too, like to, to give her credit, you know, we would try, but I think because we never were doing anything different, we would always wind up in the same place and then we'd have a big fight and then we wouldn't talk for a while and then we'd try again. And, you know, uh, researchers call this a pattern of chaotic dissociation, which really describes it very well because it is very chaotic. You never know where you are in the process and, you know, it's, it's pretty distressing. So I think partly because there's so many imperatives in our culture to be with family, you know, to work things out, to resolve problems. Um, it takes a lot to make people really estrange. And, um, and there's a lot of stigma around it, which I know we'll, we'll talk about here too. Yeah. And just, I mean, did you find any decent statistics on this in terms of how common it is? And I, I don't even know how you would ask that as a, as a survey, but yeah, are there any, are there any stats? No, there was one, um, there was one sort of survey done in the UK and, um, it, it, it is a really hard thing to get at partly because people define it so many different ways, but the consensus seems to be that it's more common than you think, yeah. um, whatever that means, whatever one thinks and that it, it actually, you know, especially if you think of it as that continuum, it probably affects, you know, 10 to 15% of families, let's say. Um, in some way, but yeah. yeah, there's not really good stats on that. Okay, and look, I mean, if I'm thinking about within my own life, I mean, there is estrangement within within my family or within our family. Um, I never met my mum's dad, or if I did, I was a baby and I don't remember it. He was an alcoholic, and when my mum um, was old enough, I, I I don't know at what point she cut him out of his life I, I definitely have had conversations about her and what her life was like growing up and, and the toll that her dad's drinking and also her mom's mental health issues had on her and I know as soon as she was old enough to be able to to leave the house and start a life on her own she she did that and then with my my partner Ali um she has a brother that she hasn't spoken to in nearly four years Ali mm. moved from from Scotland to, to London and then lives in in the UK and a big part of this is a difficult family life so I just wanted to sort of say all that up front because even prior to reading your book I was under no illusion about the supposed supposed like sacredness of, of family and that we need mm. to learn to forgive and forget like I'm a firm believer that estrangement can be one of the biggest acts of self-care that someone can make and I I want to mention this because uh, I want to say like reading your book was was confirmation bias like mm -hmm. and I want to get that bias out out in front um just to say like I'm very much pro estrangement in in the right circumstances um and I don't believe like just because family is family you've got to keep making it keep keep trying to make it work forever and forever more yeah and I think like it, a big part of the reason why I wrote the book was to convey exactly that, that like, it's not that I'm out there advocating everyone, you know, the minute you have a disagreement with a family member, you should stop talking to them. Not at all. But for me and for pretty much everyone I interviewed for this book, estrangement was like the hugest gift. And when I asked people like, do you have any regrets? <laughs> pretty much everyone said, I regret I didn't do this like 10 or 15 or 20 years earlier, you know, go no contact because some relationships just are toxic, as you said, and cannot be mended. Um, and I'm interested that you mentioned, um, you know, alcoholism, you mentioned mental health issues. Um, those are two of the biggest elements. I'm sure we'll get into talking about that, about, you know, why fam, why people wind up in an estranged sort of situation. Yeah. So do you want to describe a little bit more about your situation? So talk about your childhood, what are maybe some of the memories that stick out the most in connection to, to this situation? Yeah. So um, for me, I just, I honestly don't ever remember a time when I felt safe with my mother or, you know, loved by her, but, you know, 
we looked great as a family. It wasn't a situation of like overt abuse or, you know, poverty or anything like that. Like we looked like a middle-class family in New Jersey in the 1970s. Um, you know, my parents were together. They, they took care of my sister and me. Um, you know, we were, we had clothes, we had a place to live, you know, we had more than the basics for sure. Um, but my mother and I, I mean, I, I thought so much about it. I think we were not a good fit, which I also think is a factor for a lot of people, you know, and, and as a parent myself, I know that like, you have to let go of your expectations of your children to a large extent, except that they are who they are and they might not be whatever the, the kid you wanted, but you love them anyway. And I, I know my mother loved me in some way, but from as long as I can remember, she was highly critical. She was, um, she was mean. <laughs> There's really no other word for it. She, she, uh, you know, she was very blaming and mean and, to be fair, you know, I think there were mental health issues and, and I think she'd had a very tough childhood herself that left her with a lot of scars that she couldn't or wouldn't address. So, you know, we fought a lot, but it was different than the fighting that other people seem to have with their families. You know, it, there was never, we never made any progress in working through anything. And my mother could be just yeah, very mean. You know, she, I remember quite a few things that she has said to me over the years. And obviously everyone says things sometimes that they regret, but for her, it was a pattern of saying just the meanest possible thing at the worst possible moment. Um, there's a story that I mentioned in the book. That's actually something she did to my sister, not to me, where when my sister was like, you know, had done a year of college and hadn't worked out. She was home living temporarily. She was working and she, she had this routine where she'd come home every night and uh, make herself a bowl of ice cream and sit down and watch TV and kind of unwind from her day. And one night she did that. She went and got everything ready and opened this new carton of ice cream and it was filled with garbage. And there was a note on there from our mother saying, ha ha, gotcha. And it was like that kind of thing. Um, so there was this pattern of like, I don't know, disturbing. I think of it as emotional abuse, but where the rubber kind of hit the road for me was when I had children myself and I began to see that, you know, it's one thing for me to sort of deal with this stuff, but now you're doing it to my kids and I, I can't have that. That's not okay. That then it became clear to me that it was abuse and so many people I've talked to for this book had similar, you know, narratives like, okay, this was my relationship with this person, but then, whoa, they started doing it to my children. And I went into like a totally different mode with it. Yeah. So, I think, know, I think that human tendency to uh, be able to solve other people's problems and not necessarily <laughs> solve your own. And then when you see that playing out with, with one of your children, you're like, okay, now this is definitely not right. Yes, you can see that boundary crossing much more clearly when it's, you know, like my mother, like um, another story from the book is uh, I was visiting my parents when my oldest daughter was like three weeks old. She was super colicky. Um, and I don't even remember why I was there without my husband, but I was there and my mother really, really wanted to be a grandmother she wa she was like, why don't you take a nap or go for a walk or something and I'll take care of the baby. And I was like, still in the mode of, I'm going to just give her a chance. Maybe this is going to change things. And, you know, okay, here's the baby, but she's super colicky. She cries a lot. You kind of have to hold her all the time. Oh, sure. My mother said, no problem. So I went upstairs to get ready to go out for a walk. And I hear the baby crying, 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 which wasn't that unusual. But when I went downstairs, I saw my three week old daughter was lying on the floor by herself in the middle of the rug, screaming and crying. My mother was in the kitchen, just kind of putzing around. And I said, mom, like, what are you doing? Like, it, it wasn't like she had to put her down for a second. She wasn't really doing anything. She was like, Oh, she has to learn that she can't always get what she wants. Wow. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not really salvageable right here. So it was that yeah. kind of. 
And what about, I mean, you, you made reference to your your sister there. And so what was the relationship like with your sister and how does she see it? And, and I know you make reference in the book to often with situations like this, there can be a, a golden child. And, and so did she fit that mold? Was she like, did she, did she escape a lot of what it feels like you you suffered with? Yes, my, yes. And my sister, you know, that whole golden child thing is something that people talk about in the context of like uh, relationships with a narcissist, which I think my mother probably was a narcissist, Um, you know, where there's one golden child and then like other scapegoaty kind of kids. In our family, it was a little odd. My sister was the golden child, but it was partly because she had had a pretty rough start in life, my sister. And I think My mother felt needed by her in a different way. And therefore, you know, I think part of what she hated and didn't like about me was that I was always very independent and she just, she, she couldn't handle that. So, so yeah, she, she certainly did some crappy things to my sister, but um, nothing like what happened between us. And, you know, that's, that's also very common and it's also very painful for people because, you know, you look at this other relationship and you're like, why it must be me, right? Why is it so bad with me? It must be something I'm doing. What can I do differently? But, you know, someone, I can't remember who once said that every child in a family kind of grows up with different parents, you know, every relationship is different. And I, I think that's true. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's definitely one of the things that has come up a lot with clients that I work with and and can be so painful um, around the fact that a different child had a very different relationship with their parents and they don't really understand why. And that can often lead to a lot of the the blaming of, okay, maybe it's my fault. Because when I was reading through, you, you talked about, okay, how much this was always framed as if it was it was your problem and your fault and this that if you were behaving differently it would be very different and if that's how you are experiencing the first however many years of your life it's very easy for that to then just become your narrative for all of your life exactly and you know there's truth in it too in the sense that like My husband, you know, when we first got together and he was still in a mode of trying to fix things between my mother and me, you know, he would say like, why can't, you know, what, what if you just like, let her comments just roll right off you, you know, like, just like, you know, she's an idiot. She's mean. She's whatever. Just like, let it go. And I, you know, obviously that's a really complicated question with an even more complicated answer. We we can't do that because there's so many things wrapped up in it. But to some extent, you know, my sister let some of that stuff go. But more than that, I think there's like a fundamental, you know, I think kids will forgive parents an awful lot if there's a sort of baseline sense of being loved and accepted, you know, no matter what issues and conflicts there are on top of that. And for whatever reason, my sister had that sense with our mother and I never, ever did. Yeah. And my mother definitely framed that as my problem. What's wrong with you? You're unable to love anybody. You're selfish. You're mean. You're, you know, you, you, you're impossible. And I really believed that about myself for a very long time. And when was it that that started to change? Like how old were you before you realized like maybe there's something wrong with your mother as opposed to it just being all you? Oh, good question. I mean, honestly, I think I always knew there was something wrong with her, but when, when, when I started to really feel like, wait, maybe, (laughs) maybe it's not me 100% like responsible for this issue. I was, you know, well into adulthood. I was in my thirties or even early forties before I kind of got there. It took really, really good therapy to kind of get me started on seeing things a little differently. Right. And one of the the things you made reference to and said, okay, possibly my mother is a narcissist or was a narcissist. I mean, I think narcissism, thanks to the the tireless work of Donald Trump, has become a word that has been making it into headlines and into people's vocabulary a lot in the last four years. 
But while it's used a lot, I'm not sure that everyone knows exactly what it means. So are you able to, to describe what narcissism is or like what some of the traits that, that categorize a narcissist? Well, I'll give it a shot and then maybe you can weigh in as more of the professional here. Um, you know, my understanding of narcissism is that uh, a narcissist really can't, doesn't see other people as full human beings, you know, is, is very bound up in their own neediness and their own, um, I mean, obviously we're, we're all the hero of our own story, right? Yeah. You kind of have to be, to be a human being, but, um, you know, I think my mother lacked empathy, um, you know, altruism, anything like that. Like it was, everything was about her all the time, 100% of the time. Um, you know, and <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Donald Trump because, uh, I think like a lot of people in my position, his presidency has been horrible for me, not just because of like objective things, but because it's like all the same things that used to happen with my mother, you know, everything's about him. Every conversation or press conference he tries to give always winds up being about how great he is. It was just like that with my mother. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. What's your take as the professional here? I mean, I don't have a huge amount of, of like real solid research around, around this. So it's stuff that I've been reading on, but it was interesting when you talked about your, your sister and her having the, the more difficult start in life and how maybe that helped her with your mom. Because I mean, one of the, the things when reading around narcissism is just this real excessive need to be to be loved or to be the focus of attention and I guess if your sister was in that much need then that could have helped her to fill that void that your mother was after at least fill it more than you were able to to provide yes I think that's exactly right so um, for some people you know they need adulation in a certain way and other people need need to be needed and I mean again that's a that's you know we all have that to some extent but I think when it sort of is so when that I always felt about my mother that there was a huge empty hole in her and she wanted me to fill it in some way I mean I knew that even as a really small child and I also knew that I couldn't you know yeah. and I I I think that's a pretty common trait for narcissists yeah yeah and it was also interesting I'm I'm a huge fan of Alfie Cohen and I've read a, oh, a number did. of his books and I read or listened to him doing uh, the audible version of uh, Unconditional Parenting, uh, mm. which is amazing. So I just for you to know, I've got a, a two and a half year old son. And so I was doing a lot of this reading and research before he was born and, and in his early years, because I, I really want to try and give him the best support and start that I that I can. And it really, I mean, Alfie Cohen's research and his writing and, and point of view really resonated with me and just the the fact that he talks about most parents or maybe even all parents would say that they unconditionally love their children but it's not about what the parents say it's about what the children feel and how a child would feel in terms of what is the love that I'm getting from my parents is it unconditional or conditional yes yeah yeah I read that book as part of my research for, for my own book. And I, you know, it resonated with me too. So, um, and that's, you know, to some extent that also echoes the conversation that another conversation that comes up a lot in this subject, which is, you know, like a lot of people, a lot, I've even talked to a lot of professionals who will say like, you know, estrangement is bad unless there's, you know, really extreme abuse in a family. And then that kind of can take you down a rabbit hole of, well, well, how do you define abuse? I mean, hitting, you know, physical abuse or sexual abuse are tangible. And, you know, you can sort of say this happened or this didn't happen, whatever. But emotional abuse is very different and kind of like unconditional love. I think, uh, you know, the only person who can really define this has been an abusive situation is the person on the receiving end. You know, because yeah. um, very often I talked with some parents. I mean, a lot of times this estrangement conversation is about, you know, adult children talking about their own parents. So I did try to talk with some of the parents who had been estranged 
um, you know, to get their perspective. And I went on a bunch of forums where people talk about these things and talked with a couple of experts on it. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of that conversation will be, well, what I did wasn't abusive. That was, you know, how I was raised or that's just, you know, life is tough and I'm just preparing you for it or whatever. So, um, so I do believe that sometimes there can be this big disconnect between what a parent thinks they're doing and what the child experiences. But, but I guess most of the time, I, I mean, I have personally had to learn to trust my feelings and my responses to situations. And I think, again, because kids are so hardwired to love their parents and want their approval, yeah. you know, it kind of takes a lot to, to make a kid feel like they've been emotionally abused. And I think there's probably almost always truth to that. Yeah, and it was interesting when I was reading those sections of the book as well where you would uh, quote parents from, from different forums um, where there was almost this, this feeling of, I don't know why I've been estranged, and, and the, the, the arguments for why they shouldn't be was always like, oh, I gave the kids all this money or we took them on holidays or they had all the best toys. And it, it kind of seemed to be missing the part of what our child is really after, which is the, the sort of attention and the support and the nurturing component to it, not the, the things. Yes, and the unconditional love. And I, I, I mean, I think probably a lot of those parents including my mother, were just incapable of giving that. And so they did the best that they could maybe with what they had. They, you know, they substituted material things for the emotional things that they didn't have and couldn't give. I mean, I try, I've tried really hard to have compassion for my mother and to, you know, not blame her. Cause I think that blaming cycle just doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that is positive about estrangement is that it can kind of take you out of the blaming cycle. So, it, you know, it, it becomes not so much a discussion of, well, you did this and, and I didn't like that and that hurt and whatever. And it becomes much more of a kind of policy discussion of like, well, here's my boundary, you know, and uh, that's just how it's going to be. And I can say that with compassion for you, but it's, what I have to do to take care of myself. Um, because, you know, I mean, humans, we're messed up, you know, <laughs> we all have things that we don't do well and we have needs and, you know, but, but ultimately I think it is your right and your responsibility to take care of yourself and set some boundaries if that's what you need to do. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, as, as I've now become a parent and have a two and a half year old, I mean, I think you, you, rightfully talk about this in the book of like it's really difficult and there is a huge amount of ambivalence around being a parent in terms of you've got this absolute wonderful thing that just lights you up and creates so much joy and then at the other end of that it's like it's incredibly hard and there's times where you're reflecting of like wouldn't this be a lot easier if I wasn't in this situation (laughs) <laughs> and you, you're kind of holding those two things at the same time. And maybe it's even taboo that I'm, I'm saying it like that, but I, I think it is really difficult. And you then, as you say, you come in with all of your own stuff. You come in with all of your own potential inabilities to, to um, like in, in the case of your mother, if, if she'd had a, an upbringing where none of those things were modeled for her, like, yeah, it's not always going to be, going to be easy but that then not to say that that doesn't have an impact on on the child that's right that's right and I think I think it was Bruno Bettelheim who talked about you know the good enough parent um and although I don't agree with everything that Bettelheim ever said or wrote I think there is truth to the idea that because you know parents like you spend years with your young children um you know you're going to make some mistakes you're going to do things you regret And I think that's okay. You know, I think that kids, again, they respond to that kind of baseline, you know, uh, like my husband and his parents, you know, they definitely had some issues in their family, but somehow he, he always got that message that he was unconditionally loved, despite, you know, the fact that his father was an alcoholic and, you know, there were difficulties in the family, but, 
he doesn't have the same kinds of issues I do. And I think that's why. So that whole notion of unconditional love, you know, it's really, really hard. As you say, it's so hard to just suspend your own needs constantly for the sake of this other person in your life. But it's also, as we know, very rewarding when you can pull it off. And of course it's what, it's just what a kid needs. Yeah. And do, yeah, to, I mean, you talked a little bit in the book about the Romanian orphans and then the, the Harlow experiment. So do you want to just mention mention those? Oh, the Harlow experiments. God, they were, you know, the uh, uh, Harry Harlow and his monkey experiments where they did things like, um, you know, separate infant newborn monkeys from their mothers and then basically try them with a variety of substitute mothers to see, I mean, it's just grim even to talk about it, but, um, you know, were, were these infant monkeys attached to their mothers because they were food sources or because they were objects of affection? And, you know, there's this sort of horrible image of, um, these deprived, you know, freaking out baby monkeys clinging to these like, mother figures made out of clothespins, like, you know, hard, unyielding, inanimate, and just like clutching them because their need for that connection and that attachment was so great that it didn't matter that they were getting nothing back from this like clothespin of a mother. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think the research is pretty clear that we just have this strong in, innate need for attachment and validation and you know we all it's not just we want to be heard and seen really seen by a parent figure but we need that I think to develop emotionally properly and I think that like again like many kids in this situation I was lucky that I did have people in my life who could give that and in that case it was my grandparents my father's parents especially my grandmother who you know she was capable of unconditional love and she gave it. And I think that was redemptive for me. And I think if you don't have anyone like that in your life, I think things turn out pretty differently, you know, which is really hard. Yeah. And I, I, again, I think that's something I've noticed with clients as well. Like it, it doesn't necessarily have to come from your parents, but there needs to be some figure or figures that you have growing up who are able to instill that because it's if you haven't had this feeling of I'm unconditionally lovable when you're young it it is incredibly difficult to to rectify that because even when someone can rationally start to understand it there's a there's a very different um, situation to like feeling at at your core Yes, I think that's right. I think you never really feel it if you don't get it. I mean, I I was lucky that I got it from my grandmother, but even so, I feel I've sort of made my peace with the fact that I'm always going to there's always going to be a piece of me that feels like I'm damaged, flawed, like what's wrong with you? There's something, you know, really wrong with you. Um and luckily I have this other sort of experience and voice to sort of balance that out and I feel really deep empathy for people who don't get that at all. Cause I, I don't think you can overcome it later. You know, our, we're, we're sort of programmed so that our early experiences stick with us for, and boy, they sure do. Don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And, and for early experiences that you have no memory of, so yeah. stuff going back way before you can even start to to analyze any of this thing because it's just it's just there and it's just in in your being and it, it's one of those things that I, I I mean I reflect on on my own life and just how fortunate I have been in in that regard and and it's just complete dumb luck like I have done nothing to to earn the the level of self-esteem or feeling good within myself that I've done it's just purely because I was raised in the home that I was that I was raised in it's not because of any achievements I've done or anything along those lines and mm-hmm. that's just the 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 sad situation of like how much of this just comes down to luck yes indeed and the good news is that you know many parents can do good enough at this. And that's, 
you know, that's great. <laughs> um, so, so many people do get the kind of foundation that they need. Um, but you know, not everyone. Yeah. And how was it for you when you did then get a chance to, to leave the house and you were able to then go off for, uh, to, to college? Well, I, I basically dropped out of high school and left home at 16 because I, I couldn't function in that. I kind of ran away. Um, and I did just, I, I dropped out of high school, but I did go to college and, you know, I was young and I was in way over my head and looking back, I can see that I didn't have a lot of emotional coping skills, but I still think it was the right call because I, I just don't think I could have lasted in my house anymore um, with that level of drama and conflict and sort of abuse. So I struggled, you know, as a, I struggled in college and I struggled as a young adult. Um, and it, you know, I feel like in some ways it took me quite a long time to, to get to a place where I could like, like, like a place where maybe other people were when they were 22. I think it kind of took me into my thirties to get there emotionally, but you know, better late than never. Right. <laughs> yeah. And did you like, was writing an anchor for you in terms of like, this is something I, I always know that I'm, I'm good at. And that, I don't know, help to, to kind of pull you along? For sure. I mean, writing for me, especially when I was younger, had a very redemptive feel to it. Like this is how I'm going to make sense of the world and it's how I'm going to communicate with the world. Um, and I think partly because I felt so unable to communicate with my mother, you know, and, and my father too for different reasons. So yeah, writing, I was lucky to know early on that writing was something I, that, you know, fed me and was transcendent for me. And so, yeah. well, I know, I know in, in the very beginning of the, the memoir, you talk about the fact that you're able to remember so much of what happened because you kept journals throughout your life. And so was when, when you were writing those journals, it, it was it almost like a therapeutic um, tool that, okay, things aren't going great today at home. So I'm, I'm now doing this writing piece to, to help to deal with that. Absolutely. Yeah. It was absolutely, it was a way of processing and a way of a kind of a way of bearing witness, even if it was just to my, for myself. And I think like a lot of kids who grow up in, in a, a difficult home, um, I don't have a lot of memories otherwise um, I forget a lot of the things that happened, you know, so I've had the experience of going back and looking at reading parts of journals and being like, I don't remember that happening. And yet clearly it did because I write about it here in great detail and I, I'm not a fiction writer, so I know I wasn't making it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it can be good just, just to track it for yourself as well. Yeah. And at what point then did you, did you realize like total estrangement is my best option? Oh, I probably came to that conclusion like a dozen times, but <laughs> um, it didn't really stick until about three years before my mother died. And it was because of, there was a triggering incident that honestly wasn't really that much worse than a lot of other things she had done. But I think because of the work I had done in my life, it was so clear to me that like, well, I, I, I wrote about this in the book that it was an interaction that we had over email actually. And when I read this email that she had sent me, I literally heard like a cracking sound and I thought like my house was falling apart. And then I thought I was having a stroke or something like I, it, I vividly heard this crack and then you know, whereas before that had happened, I'd always been in this conflict ridden, like, oh my God, this is so hard, but I really, you know, I want to make it work, but oh my God, I hate her so much and blah, blah, blah. After that, it was just like, nope, I'm done. And it was very liberating, um, sad, obviously in a way, but it was just like, it was literally like I had <laughs> no more F's to give, you know, there was just like, that was it, that some line was crossed that I, and I never was tempted to, um, to heal that, you know, after, after I made that decision and conveyed it to her as kindly as I could, you know, she tried a lot of different ways to get me 
to engage again. And I was never even tempted. It was just like, I'm sorry, this is just over. It's, it's done. I don't know what to tell you. It's over. So I think, you know, it's really sad that things have to get to that point, but it was also a huge relief. <clears throat> and again, in the, the 50 or so people I interviewed for the book, a lot of people described moments like that where it was just like, that's it. I don't know. Some line was crossed. And I think you have to be ready for that. You have to prepare yourself. You have to be doing a lot of work on yourself. You have to, you know, have a certain perspective on what's happened. And then something breaks and you can't fix it and you shouldn't fix it. It's just broken. Yeah. And as you say, that must have been so liberating because before there's this sort of should I, shouldn't I, and, and you're always second guessing, whereas when there's now this this moment of clarity of like, no, this is the only way, I can, yeah. I can see how just freeing that would be. Yes, and especially because um, we haven't talked much yet about the sort of stigma of estrangement. You know, there's a lot of judgment that comes your way not just from yourself, but from your, you know, your friends, your other parts of your family and from the culture at large, when you grapple with estrangement, you know, there's so much pressure to fix things. I think, I think families that are estranged are very threatening to other families. You know, I think there's this sense of like, well, wait, if they're like that, that could happen to us too. And it's very frightening. And people, people respond to that by putting a lot of social pressure on, you know, the, like I, I got so many pressuring phone calls and letters and meetings with, you know, aunts and uncles and people in the family who just like had a lot at stake in making this go away. And so again, if you have that sense of clarity, um, it's very liberating. It just helps you put up your hand to all that and say, you know what, this is between me and this person and it's the way it is. End of story. And do you, I mean, when I read that, I, I was thinking of the, the way that we would think of divorce in the 1930s or 40s or 50s and just how taboo it was and how much people, no matter how bad the relationship was, would tend to just stay together. And now if you're getting divorced, most, like, the, most people's response isn't, come on, you've, you've got to give this a go. Like you said that this was going to be for life. It's just a, oh, okay. Yep, relationships ended divorce. And and so I'm just wondering, like, from your perspective, do you think that give a give another decade or two or three, that at some point we will have have made the the, the change in terms of how we frame estrangement um, versus how we're doing it at the moment? Oh, what a good question. It's a question I haven't really considered before. I don't know, because I think I think while divorce, you know, you could sort of see why that was threatening from a social perspective. I think this is a million times more threatening and I honestly don't know, but maybe because, because what the numbers, the, you know, the little bit of data that we have suggests that this is a lot more common than we think. So maybe, I don't know, but of course there are people who I'm, when I'm sure this was true about divorce too, as a social phenomenon, you know, there's many experts sort of wringing their hands and saying like, oh my God, this is terrible. We don't want it to get more common. We want families to, you know, heal their wounds and whatever. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, it's still such a taboo subject. You know, uh, one of the researchers I talked to um, told me a funny story, which was she, uh, when she, she sort of proposed to write her dissertation in grad school about some aspect of estrangement and her committee members tried to discourage her. They said, oh, you know, no one will talk about this. No one, you know, you won't find any people to interview. And she said <laughs> she was inundated with people who were desperate to talk about this. But at the same time, you know, they wanted to talk about it in a very one-on-one -on -one way. But but as a as a culture, we don't talk about it. And I, I'm not sure I see that changing anytime soon. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I... I, I mean, I don't know. And, and may, again, I, I kind of laid out my biases to start with. So my knee jerk reaction whenever someone would say that they're estranged would be to think, okay, there's probably a really good reason for this and that, that they're better off. So so I've definitely got a bias in, in that direction. But it also made me think of 
the the ACE study, so the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Mm -hmm. And I know before that study ran that they thought that incest happened like one in a million or one in two million homes. Like that was the, the official figures of what of how common they thought it was. Yeah. And then they did this study and it was just so much more common than that. And 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 so there was then just this shift of understanding and and maybe again maybe because I just know this topic well and at the the the, the normal layperson level they don't understand this but it just made me think okay these things are a lot more common than than people really understand and again they're taboo topics so no one's bringing them up the way that they that they are um, that would maybe demonstrate how often they're occurring but I just think that, as you say, even if this is 15% of the population that has some level of this or some incident of this within the family, that's a pretty high number. Yeah. And so, I don't know, uh, are we going to start talking about it more? And then people, like there's just more people who really start to notice there is some real benefit to doing this. Like when it's all in the shadows and no one's talking about it, people don't really understand or maybe aren't um, connecting the dots in terms of how beneficial this can be whereas I think if it starts getting talked about or more people are reading your book then I think it is because that was the thing I mean when I read your book and I was like I, I'm hoping that this is going to be the thing that allows people who are in these kind of relationships to be like hmm okay maybe taking a break on this or maybe cutting ties altogether is actually the the smart thing to be doing here. Yeah, well, that was definitely one of my goals in writing the book um, was to, you know, uh, help in some small way to push the conversation forward. But um, it's a tough conversation. There's no question about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, even just if I'm going in the the other direction, just relationships are looking different now than they than they did even 10, 20 years ago. I mean, I haven't really done a lot of research around polyamory, but it's coming up a lot more. Mm. And so I think there's a lot more just exploring different dynamics and challenging status quo around what a relationship looks like. And so I think just to be saying, oh, like family's family, we've got to just make things better because that that's your, your flesh and blood, like, I, I think that there's going to be a lot more challenge to that because people are breaking down what the normal, what the social norms have been. Yes, and because we don't need our families in that quite the same way to survive. I mean, obviously, we do need our families and, you know, for, for all, all sorts of levels of survival. But I mean, I think we have more options now as human beings, you know, like we you know, like, like even a lot of the people I talked to for this book, you know, people who have walked away from their family of origin for whatever reason, pretty much everyone talked in some way about creating a family of choice. Yeah. You know, you, you find the people that you feel that kind of connection with and you become family to each other, even though you're not related by blood. And I mean, I think maybe, you know, a hundred years ago, you didn't have as many options for doing that. So you were kind of stuck with what the hands you were dealt with, but we, you know, for better and for worse, we have more options now. And I do think that gives people more freedom to say, this is not what I want in my life. And this is what I want in my life. Yeah. I also, I mean, the, the other thing that I'm thinking of now, and maybe this is going to be different for the UK versus the US is just the way that religion plays out in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I grew up in a household where uh, I was baptised Catholic. I went to a religious school, but it was more of I went to the school because it was a good education as opposed to because my parents are really into religion. And so mm -hmm. I'm I'm an atheist. I think most of my friends would would also use that same title. And, and so there's not this big religious underpinning that is at the heart of of making decisions and how we see the world and I think there is so much then in so many traditions with religion that talk about the importance of family and then can make that more of a messy process to try and estric estricate someone your, yourself from 
because there's then this net other level of connotations about okay what does this mean as a as a religious person how is this seen by god etc yeah i totally totally agree with all of that and i know in the book you you talk about there's an organization in the uk called stand alone mm-hmm. um do you do you want to talk a little about that but also i wanted to find out if, if there's organizations like that in in other parts of the world well, to answer the second half of that first, I have not found any other organizations like that anywhere else. I think it's pretty unique. Um, and it was an organization that was started by a journalist, actually, who uh, I cannot recall the year, but some years ago, she wrote a piece for The Guardian um, where she, and I think it was right before Christmas, and she sort of talked about what it was like to be estranged from your family at the holidays, which, of course, is a big triggering time for a lot of people. And she was blown away by the response she got. Like, I don't know how many letters from people and emails just saying, Oh my God, thank you for talking about this. And this inspired her to leave journalism and start this nonprofit. And a lot of what they do, which is so interesting is um, they are a support and advocates, especially for young adults who don't have the kind of family support they need Um, to get through school, to get school loans, to get housing, you know, to get a lot of the kinds of social uh, goods that you can more easily get if you're part of an intact family. So they kind of, uh, I think that's pretty much their focus is on helping young adults, you know, adolescents and young adults. And I think it's, you know, because a lot of people um, fall behind at that time if you don't have that kind of family support. So I think the work they do is extraordinary and I wish we had something like that here in the U S for sure. And prior to writing this book and obviously doing all the interviews for it, had you found any support groups online or had you found any other people or even other forums where you were able to talk about this and discuss this, or this was something, I don't know, that you chatted about with your your husband or other members of the family. And that was kind of it. Yeah, the latter, because um, even just in researching this book, when I went looking online, I did find a number of places where, like like I said, uh, parents who had been estranged, you know, whose kids had estranged them. There were places for them to talk to each other and talk to experts, but nothing. The closest thing I found was um, a subreddit, actually, um, where people were talking about some of this, but... Um, I don't know why that is. Um, yeah. And I don't know why, but, but there's nothing that I'm aware of really, except for the, for like some odd uh, nooks and crannies on Reddit. So, um, and I think, you know, some of the reason is stigma and shame, like that no matter how clear it is to you that this relationship is toxic for me and I can't sustain it. There's still, I mean, I still feel a level of shame in having walked away from my mother, especially since she died three years later, although I couldn't have known that. It was a unexpected sort of thing. But, you know, and, and if I had a nickel for every time someone said to me, she's your mother, you only get one mother, you know, which I felt very keenly. Um, and yet, you know, I could, it didn't ultimately change what I felt I had to do, but that level of shame and obligation. And, and, and there's also a big cultural narrative around, you know, honor your father and mother, you know, no matter what, um, no matter how crappy they are, you know, to you or how, how problematic the relationship is. It's sort of your obligation and your duty as a child to, to give them that honor and respect, which, you know, so that, so that, I mean, but I don't know if any of that actually explains why it's so hard to find support. Um, but that, but that is another reason why uh, standalone is such a great organization because they kind of stand in for that role for a lot of young people in the UK, which is marvelous. Yeah. And so what do you, what have you done or what did you do to deal with the, the, the stigma or the shame of, of being an adult child who was estranged from their parents? Well, I mean, earlier in my life, when when it wasn't like a complete estrangement for years at a time, 
I mean, mostly I just suffered, honestly. And I'm, I probably made my husband suffer too. Like, I know I did. I, you know, I just like cried a lot and like, you know, I'm sure I bored my friends to tears. You know, I just sort of tried to deal with it as an issue of personal responsibility in a way like this is, you know, so messed up and I don't know what to do and, you know, just getting that kind of support. But, um, it honestly never occurred to me to look for broader support again, because this, this kind of troubled relationship for me personally, and for, for all of us in general is sort of, you know, the blame is put on the kid, you know, the person who wants to do the estranging, um, and it's one of the really interesting things that I came across in researching the book was um, the fact that a couple of studies have shown that when you ask the parents who have been estranged by their kids, what's the problem? What happened? What's the source of your estrangement? The vast majority of them say, I have no idea. But when you ask the adult children who have done the estranging, they're very, very clear about what it is. So there's this huge cognitive dissonance and this disconnect. And I struggled with that because I experienced it in my own family, right? I felt like my mother and I had, I don't know, thousands of conversations over the years where I felt like, okay, I'm a writer. I'm pretty good with words. I'm just going to lay this out very clearly, And yet, no matter how I framed it or laid it out, she said she had no idea. She didn't understand. Why can't I explain to her what's wrong? And it's very, I don't know, it really messes with your mind. But um, one of the things this researcher, Christina Sharp, who did these studies, said to me about this was, you know, I think the parents who are being estranged have a deep investment in not wanting to know what went wrong because it would be too, well, they can't do anything about it maybe, or they feel they can't do anything about it. And it's too threatening to their sort of sense of self. Um, So it's, it's easier for them emotionally on a certain level to say, I just don't understand this, which was really enlightening to me. And when you spoke to, I don't know, your sister, what, what would she say? your your mother thought was the reason like was was there anything definitive that your mother was able to to say okay I think this is why this is going on yeah my mother thought that um I didn't like her and that I was a bad person I mean that's literally what she told my sister um and that I was a very difficult person to get along with um you know so that's what she needed to believe I guess to to live with this situation. And again, I can, I, as a parent, I cannot imagine how painful it would be to have your child say, I want nothing more to do with you. You know, you're really toxic in my life. Get away from me. Like it would be the worst thing that could happen to you as a parent. You can imagine, you know, imagine that your son someday said that to you. Um, The difference I think is that, you know, I hope that if if that ever did happen to me as a parent, I would do whatever I could to figure, you know, to, to to understand it from my child's point of view and address it, whatever it was. Yeah, you know, which I think there was a story that you told about that in the in the book, and might have even been someone else's memoir or something where they where there was some reconciliation because for whatever reason someone realized it was brought to their attention and they were like, okay, I, I, this wasn't my intention, but I understand that that's how you felt. And I now need to make amends. Yes, that was, uh, that was from a book actually. And it was about a woman who had several daughters and, and was estranged from all of them. And I mean, it was very moving because she described going through a, a long, emotionally difficult process of like, not just having a single conversation and saying, well, what was it, you know, explain it to me, but, but, you know, spending years really kind of, uh, recreating a relationship where they could trust each other, you know? So one of the things that used to happen with my mother is, you know, we'd have this big fight. We wouldn't talk for a while. Then we would try to reconcile. And I, I remember saying to my mother often, you know, later on, like, we have to rebuild trust and that's just going to take time. And my mother 
didn't accept that. She was like, you either trust me right now or there's nothing. So this mom that I, that I was telling the story about, she got that and she spent a long time rebuilding that trust and being there for her daughters and accepting everything they said, not necessarily that she agreed with their perspective, but that she accepted that this was their experience and their perspective. And she validated that that was, you know, how they had experienced it. And she just kept saying, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, I hurt you. I'm so sorry that whatever. And they were able to rebuild that trust, which is like pretty cool. And, but I think I guessing it's pretty unusual. And I also am wondering if other people read that and that also keeps them in the cycle for longer because that, I mean, that's what I imagine you were holding out hope for all along. Like some, at some point, something's going to click and then she's going to change and then she's going to be that mother I always hoped that she would be. And then yeah. you read this story and you're like, oh, it happened for them. Yeah. Maybe it can now happen for me. Yeah, that's right. But I think that was probably like a one in a million, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, I, I think people, you know, I think, I think people don't tend to change in those ways unless they have a really big reason. And I think for that woman, you know, being cut off from her daughters was enough to push her to, to really examine herself and her behaviors and, and to really kind of go beyond her own feelings and sort of empathize with theirs, whatever, she, you know, whatever she thought of it, she, she, she was able to, empathetically connect with them. And I think my guess is that, I mean, in most, the vast majority of the stories I've heard, there's, there's alcoholism, there's substance abuse, or most of the time there's some kind of mental health issue that makes that parent incapable of empathetically connecting in that way. And, you know, I mean, I, I finally got to the point where I could say, I don't blame my mother yeah, she did the best she could with what she had, but it's also true that the best she could do was really bad for me. So, you know, I can walk away without saying you're a shitty per. Oops, I probably shouldn't say that. You could you could swear as much as you like. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, I can walk away without saying you're a terrible person, but I'm still walking away because that's what I need to do for myself. Yeah. And what about your husband in this? Because, I mean, early in the conversation, you said that his suggestion was, look, just ignore it or just don't take it on board. She's an idiot. Um, But did he, how long did it take before that kind of changed? And he was then on board with, okay, I, I think you not having contact is probably a wise decision. Yeah, that took about a year, <laughs> a year of our relationship. And it okay. was par- partly because early in our relationship, we were actually planning our wedding and she, she, she showed her true self to him as, you know, she did because that was who she was and she couldn't really help it. And he was like, okay, never mind. I take it all back. This is really bad. And we, you know, I don't know how to fix, suggest you fix this. So never mind all of that. <laughs> And is that something you found with other interviews that you conducted that if someone got into a relationship and there was then this outsider perspective who was able to just see how damaging this relationship was, that could then be helpful in helping the someone then make that decision to, to go down that, that road? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, I know that I always felt like, oh my God, there's something really, really wrong with me. Like I am just, you know, again, the, the, the family narrative from my mother about me was that I was always selfish, mean, I'm incapable of love. And I truly believed that. So for me, uh, you know, meeting my husband, marrying him and being married to him all these years has been intensely wonderful for a lot of reasons, but, but largely because, you know, he has offered this other perspective that's very validating and very much like, okay, I don't have to just internalize this other story. I can see that there's another way to see it. So, you know, because when you're a kid and you grew up in a family, like you don't necessarily know what other families are like. I mean, 
you just kind of think that's how it is, you yeah. know? And uh, it, it, it takes well into adulthood to even begin to get a sense that, wait a minute, <laughs> it's not always like that for everybody. There's another, other ways to be. Definitely. And I've, I've had a, a real period of reflection, especially from doing the work that I do now uh, and thinking about kids that I went to school with and and where their parents were divorced or their this and that went on and just as a child you have no understanding of how much of an impact that can be making on someone but now as an adult realizing like oh okay now that starts to make a lot more sense than it did when I was younger yeah yeah absolutely and I'd love to talk about forgiveness and and the concept of forgiveness because I mean this is something that you write a lot about in the book and really look at from, from different angles and, and kind of trying to get to the point where you like understand what it would mean for you. So yeah. Do you want to talk a little about that? Oh, forgiveness is such a loaded issue when we're talking about estrangement, because again, that, that becomes part of the social pressure that comes at you. Why can't you just forgive your mother? Why can't, you know, why are you so, why are you holding on to this resentment? Why can't you just be more forgiving? And then there's people who say, you know, when you when you stay angry at someone and you don't forgive, that only hurts yourself, which, you know, is more or less true. But I had to spend a lot of time thinking and reading about what is, you know, what does forgiveness mean? And I think for a lot of us, the idea of forgiving someone who's hurt us is scary because you think it automatically means, well, if I forgive you, then I have to make myself vulnerable to you again. You know, if I forgive my mother, then we're back in a relationship and she can just keep doing these things to me over and over again. And that's really scary. So one of the things that I had to do was separate the idea of forgiveness from the idea of reconciliation. They don't necessarily go together. You can forgive someone and we could talk about what that means because I'm still not 100% sure, but you can think in your mind, I forgive this person, but I still don't want to change the boundary I've made from them. I still don't want to be vulnerable to them. I mean, it wasn't until after my mother died that I could really think about all this stuff. And I realized it was because she couldn't hurt me anymore. You know, yeah. that on some level, even though it, it, it didn't even make that much sense. I mean, I was an adult with my own life and, you know, like, what did it matter what she said? But, but it did matter. You know, it very much mattered. Um, so, and what is forgiveness? Like, that's something I've thought a lot about, you know, does, does forgiving someone mean you say it's okay what you did? I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. Does it mean saying, I understand why you did what you did? Maybe, I don't know. Is that a component of it? You know, does it mean like saying, I don't, hate you (laughs) for what you did, or I'm not overtly angry at you. Like I actually still grapple with that sense of what does it mean to forgive someone? And the closest I've been able to come is to say that you, you can think about them with compassion and an open heart, even if you don't like what they did or don't want to have a relationship with them. But actually it's something I'm kind of obsessed with. So maybe I ask you, what do you think forgiveness is? So, the, I mean, I've been thinking about this and as part of reading your book and in preparation for this. And I, I will just say that I, I haven't had the, the situations that you've had and I, and I haven't had a situation in my life where there's been this deep hurt and pain where I've been in a situation where I have to be then wrestling with the idea of forgiveness. So for me, this is all in theory. And and so it looks very different than when this is like in your nervous system and you're having to, to really deal with it. But I do, I mean, I was aware of the idea of forgiveness without reconciliation. And I think being able to separate those two is, is really important. And the, the, the thing that people say, I don't know where it originates, but it's like staying angry with someone is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to get to get ill. <laughs> and, and so I get the forgiveness piece 
as again, a, like an act of self-care of like the forgiveness is really not about that other person. It's how do you get to a point that this is now not just damaging to yourself because it's not going to be damaging to that other person. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there's that. And I mean, you, you talked about starting to explore and I don't know when this happened, but looking into your mother's own upbringing mm-hmm. and doing that exploratory work of like understanding, okay, what made her who she is and, and if that helps to soften the blow somewhat. And, I mean, for me, I've done a lot of reading around the idea of, of free will and I've actually done a whole solo podcast on this topic and, and I'm a pretty big believer in we don't have free will and mm. that we are uh, the just... Uh, impacted upon all by all the prior causes in our life whether that be genetics whether that be upbringing whether that be cosmic rays whatever it is and so I can get to a place with that again where you're like okay just because someone did something horrible doesn't necessarily mean I excuse the behavior and it doesn't necessarily mean that I want to have that person hanging around within my life and continuing to to cause problems but there's some level of like if I was in their shoes, I'd had their upbringing, I'd had every single experience that they'd have, who am I to think that I would do something different? Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's very wise. Um, the only thing I would add is that I think anger is a necessary part of your process yep. toward forgiveness or more rec- reconciliation if that's where you're going. Like I think – I think if you don't let yourself really feel the anger and really be aware of it and experience it, then you can't, then it does, it never goes away. And that's a part of it. Um, So like, you know, you hear stories about, you know, parents who stand up in courtrooms at the trial of the person who killed their child and they say, I forgive you. And I'm like, how could you possibly you know, you're skipping a step. And I think that's not, that's something else. That's not forgiveness. I don't know what that is. Yeah, no. And I, I agree. And what, what I've just outlined again is, is very detached is very theoretical. I I don't like if something happened to my son at the hands of someone else, I don't think I would be on day one instantly going to, Oh, look, no one has free will. So it's not that person's fault. Like that would take a long time to, get to the place where I genuinely feel that within my bones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if for, for me, it's like, okay, that's, I don't know, the mental model of the, the theory or thre- theoretical framework that I'm, I'm starting from. Um, mm-hmm. And then let's see how, how well I'm going to be able to keep that up when the, the emotions really come into <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just like meditation is great in theory and then let's see what happens when when the rubber hits the road and, and you're in a real situation. Um, yeah, it's great when you're calm already. <laughs> when you're freaking out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you made reference to a book that I hadn't heard about but I thought was really interesting. So The, the Sunflower by um, Simon Weisenhall. Do you want to just talk a little about that? Because I thought that was a, it sounds like a fantastic book. Oh, it really is. Have you have you had a chance to look for a copy of it? Because I have really- I have not, but I I would like to. It's this little book, um, and it's basically Simon Wiesenthal was um, uh, a, a Jew who was um, incarcerated at Auschwitz and I think a couple of other concentration camps during the Holocaust, and who survived. Um, and in it, he tells a story of something that happened to him one day while he was just, you know, a prisoner, um, he was just yanked out of line and asked to go up into this room where there was a young Nazi soldier who was dying. And this soldier wanted to kind of confess to a Jew. Any Jew was just like, he was pulled out of the line at random. And so, um, so he was made to sit there for a number of hours and listen as this soldier basically described all these horrible things that he had done, um, killing Jews, setting fire to buildings full of people, like killing children, like the worst things. And then at the end, basically said to Simon Wiesenthal, do you, you know, I need you to forgive me. 
And it was like, what should he do at that point? You know, which is another way of saying like, what does it mean to forgive? And what he did in that moment was he, he walked away. He did not say, I forgive you. He didn't offer any consolation. He left, but it, but it bothered him a lot. He, and long after the war, he, he basically told this story to, I don't know how many, a number of prominent philosophers and thinkers and, you know, Jewish, non-Jewish, a whole range of people and said, what was the right thing to do? And what would you have done? And so he, so the book is his story. And then all of these responses that he gathered from other people. Um, And it's pretty interesting because it pretty much covers the gamut of the way people think about forgiveness. Um, uh, So yeah, it's really, really thought provoking read and it's short and it's a fast read. So I recommend it. And did it help you better understand forgiveness? Was there anything that you took out of that where you're like, okay, that, that is really, yeah, that, that's something that I, I hadn't thought about before. Well, I think that might be where I was first exposed to the idea of forgiveness, but not reconciliation. Yeah. I think pretty sure one or two of the people in there, you know, wrote about that. I mean, a lot of the people he approached to weigh in on this were religious and I'm not a religious person. So, you know, that, that didn't resonate with me, but uh, one thing that did resonate with me was this idea that, you know, this soldier was asking Wiesenthal to forgive him for things that hadn't been done to him. So, you know, forgiveness by proxy in a way. And there was a pretty clear consensus that that's not a thing. You know, you cannot, I can't give someone forgiveness for something that they did to someone else, you know? So, so that was kind of enlightening to me also. Um, But didn't really, it didn't really, at the time it didn't help me with the thing I was struggling with was, which was what does it actually literally look like to forgive someone? And how do you know when you're actually doing it and not just like going through the motions? So I had to kind of come to that myself. And then what about your experience with the the Stanford forgiven forgiveness project? Do you want to talk about that and, and explain what that is? Yeah. I went to this weekend workshop in New York city run by uh, a guy who that's his project. He founded it. And it was, it was two days of like being in a small intense group talking about forgiveness um, and getting his perspective on it. And, you know, I don't know, there were like a dozen of us and, and, and he very much Fred Luskin, he very much sort of falls into the category of, you know, you forgive because it's better for you to forgive. And, Uh, you know, it only hurts you if you're not forgiving. And also his perspective was, you know, when we, when we're angry, when we hold anger at someone in that way, it's because we expected or wanted them to do something different than what they did. And that's just us expecting the world to be a place that it's not. (laughs) So in a way, I think he sees forgiveness as like, uh, accepting reality, the reality of how the world is and how people are and, you know, understanding that we're not special and we don't deserve special treatment. Um, but he, he did help me see this idea of, you know, I think he posed a question to me at one point, like, can you think about your mother with an open heart and still not want to get back into a relationship with her? So he definitely helped me with that, that separation, which was necessary to feel safe enough to begin whatever process it was. Yeah, it was also interesting. He used this analogy that you made reference to in the book um, just as part of helping you to accept the situation of like if you have got a busted up knee or you've you've ripped open your knee, like the, the, the options that you have is to kind of just carry on with that constant pain or to, to have surgery, like you wishing that you didn't have um, the problem with your knee is not going to not gonna change the situation. And then before we jumped on this call, I was checking out your Instagram and I noticed that you've had knee surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, that, that, that is quite hilarious. 
yes. And I would have to say, I wish I hadn't, I wish I wasn't in this pain, but you know, <laughs> as he pointed out, it doesn't pay to wish that things were different than they are. You know, you, we, and, and there's real truth to that, right? We have to deal with, we have to deal with the world the way it is and we have to deal with other people the way they are. But what's again, the liberating part of that is to say, yeah, I have to like, I have to accept that's who my mother was. You know, she was never going to turn into the mother I wanted. So then the only control I have is over my own actions, you know? And so for me, as for a lot of people, you know, that's why it's so liberating to say, you are who you are. I accept you for who you are, but I don't want you in my life. And that's, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. And I think that acceptance piece as well lines up a lot with what I see with, with eating disorder recovery is there is so much of like, I want to recover, but I want these different things to happen and mm-hmm. I want it to be yeah. like this. And it's like, but that's not on the menu. Like that, that is not going to happen. Like the, the reality of the situation is these are the things that need to happen for you to recover. And the, the, the reason that people will stay stuck is because there's the, 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 the constant trying to find another way to be able to do recovery in the way that they want it to to look like. And in the same way, it's like people stay stuck in these relationships because they're constantly trying to find a way that it will look differently or be different when all the messages you're being sent for, for decades is now like, okay, that's just not going to happen. Right. So, and and that's a great analogy because it's like, it was like all the years I spent wishing that I had a different mother. But, you know, I had to accept that that was the mother I had. That was who she was. I had to let go of any longing for her to change. I mean, you know, let go of most of it. I think you never let go of all of it. But and say, okay, this is how it is now. Now, how do I choose to respond to it? Yeah. But I know what you mean. And I also want to say, like, I don't like if any of what I just said there was sort of glib of like, hey, just get on with it. Like, just get in touch with reality. Like, that's definitely not how it is. And I, I, I don't mean that it's it's easy or simple or anything along those lines. But I just that's where I often see the uh, similarities. No, I, I agree with you as someone who knows quite a bit about eating disorders, too. I I think there is a certain level on which it's it's not that it's not that um, flippant, just get on with it, but it's yep. more, it's a process and it, and it often involves grieving and feeling angry, you know, grieving for what you feel you don't have and being angry about wishing things were different. But ultimately it is about accepting how things are and then making your choice. Yeah. Whatever that choice is. Yeah. And so what about your, your dad? Is he, is he still alive and, and how's the relationship with him going? Cause I know the book ends focusing a little bit on that, but it, it was, came out two years ago. I don't know at what point you actually finished writing it. So yeah, I just wanted to get an update of where things with that are. Yeah. My dad died almost exactly a year ago, but, okay. um, but before he died, uh, so, so part of the backstory was I was more or less estranged from him too, because, uh, my mother said, you know, if you're not in a relationship with me, you can't be in one with him. And he was the kind of person to go along with that, which is, I think how he stayed married to my mother. But, um, so I really didn't have a relationship with him. And then after she died, he wasn't sure he wanted to pick up a relationship with me, which was really hurtful but I understood it. Eventually he decided he did. And we were able to, um, to reconcile and to have some time together. And then, um, he had a catastrophic stroke and, um, he wound up moving up to the town that I live in, uh, to an assisted living place. And I was kind of his caregiver for the last four years of his life. And that was, a pretty healing experience for me. I mean, we had been able before his stroke to talk about a lot of the stuff that happened, but not resolve it. I mean, I'm not sure there was any way to resolve it. It was just, we were able to share our feelings with each other. And then when he was here and in a somewhat vulnerable position, it was good for me because I was able to feel like I was able to reconnect with my sense of love for him and compassion for him I was also still angry at him for, you know, things that had happened, but 
but I was able to kind of also have this other thing and rebuild this other connection with him. And, you know, I'm still really sad that he died. Um, you know, and I miss him, even though I also have all those other feelings. So for me, it was a, it was a bit of a happy ending that we were able to come to that place. I mean, even before his stroke, you know, where we could reconnect and it, it felt, um, it felt good. It did. And did it feel like his perception of you shifted because your mother wasn't around giving her input, which was coloring his view and you were then more in that, I don't know, caregiver role. And and so that, that, I don't know if it, if it shifted things for how he saw you then, or if it shifted things for how he saw you actually across your whole life. Well, that is a good question. I hope it should. I, I, my husband would say it absolutely shifted things. You know, I, I remain a little unsure, partly because my dad was never a big talker. And then after he had the stroke, he couldn't talk, although he was still totally with it mentally, but he couldn't, he didn't have language anymore. So I think it did shift things for him. I think he saw me differently. And I recognize that part of part of why I wanted him to come to my town and not go to where my sister was, was because I wanted to show him that I was actually, you know, a person capable of love and care. And, you know, um, and so I don't know. I hope so. But who? I'll never really know. Yeah. And I, I know we've talked about how much of a taboo topic this is. So how much did your kids know about all of this when they were growing up and then young adults? And, and I mean, have they, have they read the book? <laughs> no, they haven't read the book. They don't want to read any books that I've written. Can't really blame them. Okay. Um, but, you know, I tried when they were kids to not color their relationship with my mother, which was, of course, impossible. But the reality is they saw enough of my mother's bad behavior, let's say, or, you know, upsetting behavior. They, they experienced it, and they also saw her do it to me over and over again. So um, they both went through periods, like, when they were teens where they wanted to have more of a connection with my mother, and I tried to facilitate that. And for both of them, my mother pretty much blew it immediately. So they, they both, I think, felt and still feel like your mother was kind of a jerk and, you know, you shouldn't worry about it <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I'm not one of the, I wasn't one of those parents who could hide everything that was happening to me. I mean, I tried to, but really like, like, like my younger daughter, you know, when she was 13 was like, I want to go down to, you know, Florida and see my grandparents. And I was like, okay, sent her down. And, you know, within like five hours of arriving, she was on the phone saying, crying, saying, I want to come home, you know, because my mother of what my mother was doing. Um, So I think, you know, like my mother was who she was and she couldn't be someone else. And they experienced that too. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, I've been thinking about this as well as being a, a parent and thinking about how I was raised. And I think with my parents, there was, there were probably people that they didn't get on so well with within the family, but that was never really discussed with us. And we were just, um, had relationships with them and our relationships would be our relationships with them. Um, mm-hmm. and it's only, now as we become older and adults that we can have more of those conversations. And I think most of the time my, my leaning would be towards that, but I guess there, there is a threshold in which things are crossed. And for that reason, I never met my grandfather or if I did meet him, um, it was when I was very young and it never happened ever again or, or so, so yeah, I I think it's, there there is no blanket rule. It is kind of a, a difficult thing to, to decide. Yeah, for sure. And in terms of, oh, go on. No, I was just going to ask if you had brothers and sisters. I do. I've got an older brother and a younger sister. And I mean, Mm -hmm. it's also interesting, you know, you talked about the, what it would be like to have your child then be estranged and and leave you. And I, I often reflect on the fact that at age 21, I left Sydney and moved to the UK and I've never returned. I mean, I've, I've gone there on holidays, but I've now been, 
Uh, I think of as of last week, it was 17 years living living over here. So that's it's not it's not total estrangement, but it, it's definitely something my parents have to deal with, and I'm not I'm not around the corner the way that my my other brother and sister are. Yeah, that's got to be hard for them, and yet, of course, it's your life to do with as you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think there's, it, it was interesting because I, when reading through it, the, in terms of the definition of estrangement, it can be having uh, limited conversations or, or limited contact with, with people. And there's definitely be times where throughout a year, I might only speak to my brother two or three times just because we've, yeah. we've both got kids. We're both very busy. But the, the difference is when I then, see him because I go over there or he comes over here. Like there, there's no animosity. It just, we are sort of back into, to us being, seeing siblings and, and enjoying spending time with one another. So, so even, even though we, maybe we, we meet the definition for estrangement in some ways, it definitely doesn't feel like that. I don't think of that as estrangement. I, I just think of that as life circumstances, you know, which obviously there's an element of, uh, choice involved but I mean as you say you know like with my husband and his brother they only talk about twice a year um they're not there's not animosity but there's also not closeness like I think that's a little wee bit of estrangement you know but yeah anyway you know it's kind of like how you define it though so (laughs) yeah and when writing the book was there was there worries about, okay, what is the family going to think? Like, it was, was there any of that for you or oh, you, you yeah. kind of passed it? Oh, no, no. There was huge worries. And in fact, um, mainly about my sister because, you know, we, I have a relationship with her and I want to maintain a relationship with her. I'm aware that we see things very differently. Um, so I actually sent her the manuscript before it was finalized um, and she was very upset by it and had some things she wanted me to change. And we talked about things. And um, at some point she said to me, I just was unaware of a lot of the things you're writing about. So I think it was, it was good. Um, There are big chunks of my family that don't talk to me at all though. I mean, and not because of the book necessarily, but, you know, the book didn't help. <laughs> so I just have to come to terms with that. And that's okay because, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So look, Harriet, this has been a wonderful conversation. Is is there anything that we haven't chatted about or any areas that you want to spend a bit more time on that we, that we did touch on? No, I think it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate how um, thoughtful you've been and how, um, you know, yeah, I really appreciate this. I think you've, you've hit everything really. So thank you for that. Perfect. Well, look, if people want to find out more, where do you want to be pointing them towards any sort of website, social media, any of that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but by all means, you can, you can list them for people. Yeah, I've got a website. It's just harrietbrown.com. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to find on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and I have a Facebook page uh, that's, I think it's called Good Nonfiction. But, you know, you can just look it up. And I'm happy to connect with people. I actually have ongoing conversations with many, many people. Um, I think pretty much everything I write winds up being fairly personal and people connect to it personally. And so, Um, I mean, that's one of the pleasures of doing this work is getting to connect with other people who have had similar experiences or, you know, related experiences. So we all have to remind each other that we're not alone in our feelings and our experiences. Yeah, definitely. So if people are wanting to contact you, what's the best avenue to do that through? Um, They can email me at uh, Harriet at harrietbrown.com. I think that's the email address you have for me. So, which is the one that you can get that on my website. So okay, I'm happy for that kind of connection. Perfect. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today. This was a really great conversation. And as I said at the beginning, this is something that is impacting on lots of clients that I'm seeing. So I think they're going to get a lot of benefit out of this. Thank you so much for hosting and facilitating it. And, you know, um, I I would be interested at some point in knowing more about the work you do with eating disorders patients too. So 
Okay. I'm, I'm glad to connect with you. So that was my interview with Harriet Brown, and I'm really thankful that we had the time to really delve into this topic in the detail that we did. And despite how much we got to chat about this, we really just scratched the surface uh, on everything that she covers in her book. So if this is something that is going on in your life um, and it's something you want to find out more about, then please do check out Harriet's book, Shadow Daughter. So for me, on to a, a recommendation of something to, to check out. If you've been following this podcast for any length of time or if you've listened to my end-of-year roundup episodes, you'll know that one of my favorite podcasts is Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History. Well, the fifth season of that has just started again, or at least has started at the point at which I'm recording this intro. And each season is only 10 episodes, and they're between sort of 30 and 50 minutes long, most of the episodes. And for the next 10 weeks, every Thursday, I will listen to the episode on the Thursday as soon as it comes out. And most episodes are standalone episodes, so you don't have to listen to them in order, although he does and has done some two-part episodes or three-part episodes on a particular topic. But even with those, he makes it so most of them can can still be listened on their own and, and make sense. And each season has a general theme around it, but he has a really great way of just talking about all these different ideas and topics and things that we think we know about from history and why this maybe needs a second look and that there's some other explanation for what's going on. And it's incredibly well produced and I always find it fascinating. And so I'm excited for the next 10 weeks and highly recommend checking it out. And if you do like it or like Malcolm Blabwell uh, in terms of any of his other books and you haven't listened to his most recent book called Talking to Strangers, I would highly recommend giving that a listen. He does an amazing job on uh, the the audio uh, version of it, so through, through Audible, uh, making it much like a podcast where there's music and if he's interviewing a guest or interviewing a subject for the book, he will play the the recording of that interview. So rather than what I find with a lot of audiobooks, it can become quite tedious and, and boring because someone has a, a, a not great narration style. He makes it very easy to listen to and very interesting. And given what is going on in the world at the moment in terms of uh, race relations and and uh, everything breaking down with the police and, and all of that, uh, it is a book that is well worth having a listen to because uh, a lot of the topics he explores as part of that is is covered in the book. So that's my recommendations for this week. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Seven Health is currently taking on clients. If you're struggling with dieting, uh, recovery, disordered eating, body image issues, or, or really any of the topics that we cover on the show, then please get in contact. You can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help. I will be back with a show again next week. Uh, until then, take care of yourself, stay safe, and I will see you soon.